Hello, my name is Beryl Shepherd, and I am a Trust Volunteer. Welcome to this presentation, which we hope will leave you better prepared for your role as a trustee. It is designed so that you can read the slide and then listen to further explanation. The purpose of this presentation is to identify good governance and to have a better understanding of how your U3A should be run and where to find any support you may need. These are the three main areas that contribute to good governance and can be interpreted as mandatory, must do, best practice, good idea, and lastly, freedom to make your own rules and we will be dealing with each in turn as we continue. These are the mandatory items and we will go through each one individually. All U3As are charities in their own right and have different regulatory bodies depending on which country within the UK the charity is registered. They all produce guidance for trustees. Annual returns must be filed within 10 months from your financial year end and changes to your constitution within 21 days of the general meeting at which it was agreed. All other changes, for example new trustee details, should be filed as soon as possible. Before you can claim gift aid, you must be registered with HMRC. You do not need to have a charity number if your gross income is less than £5,000 per annum. Gift aid, which will increase your donations by 25%, can be claimed for up to four previous years. You will need the members to sign a declaration form to say they are taxpayers. You must submit a tax return if you are asked by HMRC to do so. General Data Protection Regulations GDPR, are designed to protect individuals' personal data and your U3A should have a series of policies and procedures in place in order to manage this. Basically, anywhere you collect data is covered by these regulations. You could download the presentation called GDPR for more detailed information. As the terms of membership have changed over the last 40 years, it may be that your U3A has a different version from the current one, although it may be similar. It will almost certainly include agreeing to follow the U3A principles. It is a moot point as to whether one charity can make decisions over the constitution of another once it has been initially agreed. Have a look at what your own constitution says on the matter. It is essential that all trustees are familiar with their constitution and that it is reviewed by the committee from time to time. In 2018 there were changes to the objects of the Third Age Trust which are relevant even if your U3A didn't change theirs. Basically it meant that anything done under the U3A umbrella must go through the accounts including trips out etc.
trustees are jointly and severally responsible for the actions of the other trustees. These responsibilities cannot be delegated. Reading the essential trustee is advisable and watching the presentation called trustee induction may also be helpful. Annual general meetings give transparency as to who and how your U3A is being run. Remember to read out the notice or ask the meeting to accept the notice as read. It will depend on your constitution as to what is corrupt and whether the chairman has a casting vote. A meeting that is not corrupt must be postponed, but the postponed meeting can be held even if not corrupt. You may need to elect scrutineers. You should also bear in mind that any member of the public is entitled to attend the AGM, but has no voice and no vote. Unusual times at present equals COVID-19. If your AGM has been postponed or cancelled, please let the membership know. The minutes of the AGM, held by other than normal means, should state the method used, especially if there is no provision for this method in your constitution. It would be sensible to also record the date of the committee meeting at which the decision was made. We will discuss the various methods as we proceed. This model format is not written in stone but gives an idea of what should be included and suggests a possible way to proceed. Even in these unusual times, it is important that you follow the timescales as per your constitution. Voting by post will need to take into account the timings so as to allow sufficient time for all the processes to happen, including the opportunity to ask questions. An example of the timings might be 1st of June, send out email soliciting volunteers for the various vacancies with a date for their return of, say, 15th of June. On June the 20th, send out the official notice stating that all replies must be back by the 13th of July, result to be announced one week later. Should there be more nominations than vacancies, members should be warned about voting for too many nominees, as this would invalidate their vote. Proxies vary from postal votes in that you can choose to vote on your own behalf or give the option to the chairman or another member to vote as he or she sees fit or a mixture of both. Whatever means can be interpreted as by hand, by post or by electronic means if your members have access to a scanner or a smartphone. Another way would be to send out the notice and voting papers by email and ask the member to complete and return by email. The disadvantage being that in most cases the form would not be signed. Hosting your EGM on video conferencing platforms such as Zoom or Microsoft Teams may not be a good idea if several of your members do not have the knowledge 
or the inclination or the technology to take part. Whilst you will almost certainly have a clause in your constitution that says omissions to give notice to any member shall not invalidate the proceedings, the omission must have been accidental and not by design. However, all is not lost. The Trust organises Zoom tutorials and these can be found under national workshops in the advice section of the website. If you have a suitable website and a brilliant webmaster, it may be possible to conduct the virtual AGM via your website. Once the day and the time arrive, holding a special general meeting is the same as holding an AGM, but the content will be different, as SGMs are called for a specific purpose. The secret of good governance is to have the right procedures in place and involve as many members as possible in the running of your U3A. That way you will be able to function effectively. Best practice is ex exactly what it says on the label and are the ways of working that have been tried and tested. These are just some of the things that make up best practice, but there are others. You will probably find by experience where the gaps are. This list is not exhaustive, but it is important to have something written down to cover these areas. Some U3As have bylaws or standing orders which cover your own rules, but must be compatible with your constitution. Any differences would mean that the constitution would prevail. The advantage of bylaws or standing orders is that they can be amended by the committee, whereas changes to the constitution need to be approved by the membership at a general meeting. This is just some of the help that is available, but don't forget the e-workshops that can be downloaded from the Trust website. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the experience and remember that feedback is always welcome.